And I think Jack is passing around the mic, so please raise your hand. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Calvin from Singapore. Thank you very much for the excellent presentations. Um, I'm, I'm just struggling a bit to see how the research agenda fits in with systemic concerns, in particular in terms of the health systems uh, in the two different countries. Uh, so while I understand that it's meant to improve, um, say, diagnosis, uh, how does it ultimately impact on service delivery? And, and is there uh, some kind of conversation or coordination that particular organizations uh, have been um, responsible for are actively looking into? Thanks very much. Sorry, I'm struggling to hear your question. Just the last, if you can just summarize the last sentence again. Yeah, so, so basically I'm wondering if uh, within your respective countries, if there is some kind of agency that's, that's responsible for coordinating the efforts to see how ultimately some of the research work we've done, very important work, fits back and channels back into health systems and systemic capabilities. Thanks Should very I start? much. Um, so the work that I presented on the Health Information Exchange that is a project of the Department of Health for, so in South Africa, we have provincial health capacity. The province provides the health services rather than a national provision of health services. And um, so because our data center is um, using data from the Department of Health and it's managed by the Department of Health and it sits in the Department of Health, it then provides this, um, enriched data source for the health system um, strengthening. And that's our, our primary reason to be there. I'm not sure if I'm answering your cr uh, question correctly. So we have, for example, we have a, a classic example that we may all understand is HIV care cascade. So we roll up the data into an HIV care cascade, which is a line per, per patient which would say when that person was diagnosed, when they started treatment, have they defaulted on treatment, what are their outcomes, what are the recent viral loads, what are the recent CD4 counts, et cetera. And we have a reporting interface, so a facility manager would be able to say, to query with the right, obviously with the right permissions, et cetera, who in, my, in the care of my facility today has an uncontrolled viral load? or who has defaulted on their art, or who should we chase up to ensure that they're not falling through the gaps. So we have a presentation of reports. We have a variety of reports, and we're adding to them all the time um, that provide. Another one is colposcopy and H you know, the pap smear cascade. Who got a colposcopy, should have been followed up, wasn't. That kind of value add we develop um, as reports for our clinical end users. We also have a browser-based um, access point for clinicians who, have a, who are facing a patient and want to see their full medical record. Each of the platforms individually, if you work at one facility, you can only see the records for that facility. But through the data center, you can see the full longitudinal record of your patient. So we have a browser-based interface that allows a clinician with the right access to see the full data record for their patient in front of them. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah. Well, in my case, it was a study of uh, academic research, and my partner was my university. Uh, if, if in Peruvia uh, you want to make a research, uh, we have facilities to get the data from the health minister. Uh, NIH uh, in Peru is, 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 uh, give facilities to, to get information. Yeah, uh, the presentations actually were very enlightening. Thank you. Uh, questions to Nikki. Um, just to understand, how do you implement uh, unique identifiers in public health? Um, and then uh, the second question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, you determine the research that is has direct benefit to the to the uh, specimen or data uh, don or owners, where you collect the data. Uh, I'm wondering how you really determine this direct benefit. 
because sometimes the research is not, you, you don't uh, know what's gonna come out of it until you get to see the results. So how do you really determine the direct benefit? And then uh, who oversees your activities to ensure you're compliant, especially that you may have uh, some of your uh, investigators who may have interest in pursuing some questions, how do you get around all that? Who ensures that you, because you seem to be the one collecting the data, you're the ones giving authority who accesses the data, how do you overcome conflict of interest when it arises? Sure, so from the unique identifier perspective, we're very lucky in the Western Cape that over a decade ago, our um, tertiary health facilities instituted a platform called Clinicom, and they, that has a unique patient identifier. And the other platforms as they came online actually talked to a central patient master index that accesses the Clinicom identifier. So the primary health care and the um, dispensing platforms all speak to that identifier. And the National Health Laboratory System also has a field that will try and capture that identifier. It's not without problems. I think our maximum to date is one patient who has 15 unique identifiers. So linkage and de-identification is a big part of our uptake ETL process. Um, and that's also why we have 12 million unique identifiers in our database for a population of 6.6 .6 million because we haven't uh, completely linked people with multiple identifiers. In terms of the direct benefits, um, so we, we look at, uh, so these are for research requests that come in from outside the health service. Um, obviously we have epidemiological research questions that come from within our health directorate uh, that are de dealt with separately. Um, we'll look at things uh, like, did the requester, has the requester had anything at all to do with healthcare of any description in our environment? And I can assure you that we receive many requests from people who have never foot, you know, set foot in Africa or South Africa or the Western Cape or a single one of our facilities. So that for us would feel really that those people don't understand the context of the data that they're receiving um, and, and they have no interest in health service strengthening for us and actually they have no interest in benefiting patient outcomes. So um, the oversight is done. We have a, um, a delineated governance structure and there are layers of governance that go through. So all our decision making is put in a, um, it's, it's all described, and there's a very clear process, the different layers, so, so the documents are reviewed by analysts who check, I think I mentioned all the, the permissions, the uh, informed consent, et cetera, et cetera. From there it goes up to the manager of the data center, from there it goes up to the health impact assessment directorate, and then from there, if we have questions around anything, there's a, a provincial research ethics board that also have reviewed where we feel that we're not quite comfortable making a call in that structure, then it refers up to that process. So everything goes through committees in a formalized process. Um, just to your comment, um, I can, perhaps it will clarify if I say, I think there's in, in nearly three years of existence of the data center, we only have one academic publication out of that. So we are not the investigators working in that um, environment. Our primary reason to be there is to build a, an amazing internal resource to provision healthcare. So we are not academic researchers collecting data and publishing on it. We're a, a group within the Department of Health building a, a data exchange for the provision and continuity of healthcare. So yeah, if I were um, to require or request a data set in my other life as a researcher, it would go through all those same protocols. And just also for your comfort maybe, we have in our governance structure, we log every single query of the data, uh, database that's ever made. So if any of us ever were to look up our neighbor's data, it would be 
revealed in all its glory uh, very easily. We also have the um, Promotion of Access to Information Act. So if any individual wanted to know what had been done with their data, every single data set, anonymized, aggregate, or identified, internal, external, every ID that goes out with every data set is captured. So if you came to me and said, here's my clinical number or my ID, I want to know what, what you've done with my data, within two minutes I could tell you every single use of your data and every single query logged against your details. Kathy, I think you had a question. And can I just um, request from colleagues in the audience to introduce yourselves So um, before you ask your question? Okay, um, this is working, yes. Hello, I'm Kathy Roth. I'm the Senior Research Fellow in Infectious Diseases and Epidemics from the UK Department for International Development. My question is to Nikki. Sorry, you're receiving all of these, and it's about no, a different great. aspect of the health information exchange that you've set up. Uh, you mentioned that um, um, you're very, very careful to be very clear about the consent and what things are for, and you also have mentioned that um, you have asked specifically to some individuals whether they are willing to be recontacted for further study if indicated. But I wondered, what are you doing or have you considered what you might do about making the information about the findings or outcomes of uh, research that has been done or analysis that has been done, uh, any benefits, changes in the system, any positive outcomes from their participation in research whether identified or not, uh, how do you feed that back to the community so that they can understand and the system can grow? Yeah, so um, just to clarify the, um, the proposed asking if people want to be recontacted, that's not in place at this point. It's something that we want to look at going forward for a sort of tiered consent process. So in terms of returning um, results, um, at the moment, because the bulk of our work is operational requests, the, the return is, in fact, in the strengthening of health systems um, and, and operationally people receiving better health care. So, so people don't receive data sets and then write a report that gets published. They receive data sets and say, oh, my word, we're missing this group of people here, and they're action it. So it's not an academic reporting environment. That said, obviously, we have these research data requests that come in through the system and are processed according to the structure I outlined. So people who do do academic research are publishing in peer-reviewed um, in peer-reviewed journals. How do you let them know that improvements have been made to the system by doing Okay, the types yeah. of things that you have mentioned. So, so the, the proposal that we are looking at actioning now is to have um, waiting room media that describe what's happening, describe how the data is being used, describe the intentions. But to be honest, um, you know, to return the, res the specific results of every single finding, I don't think it's realistic mm -hmm. because we're not writing reports that are digestible. Uh, and we've, we've already processed a huge number of internal data requests just in the short space we've been operational. So I, there's not a formal structure for every single data set having a report then disseminated to the whole of the Western Cape um, patient population in the same way that I think any health service is health service strengthening. If you improve systems in your hospital, you're not returning the information to everyone in the hospital exactly what was done, when, and how. So it's very much an internal operational process. Okay, so um, I have a question there. There's a colleague here and one at the back and then Florencia. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Nikki and Agueda, for your presentations. My name is Fabiana Arzuaga. I'm from Argentina, from the okay. Ministry of Science, Technology, and Productive Innovation. Uh, it is more than a question, a comment. Um, Comparing the presentation that made um, Aki Nabayomi at the beginning regarding the situation of Africa and the research in biobanks, and your presentation, Nikki, and my comments is um, there is a big difference between the general landscape that presented Aki and the case you have presented. So it is an example, it's a unique example, or there are many others, and that 
first generalization is not so, so bad as presented. Uh, can I just confirm I'm understanding your question correctly? Are you asking me whether what I'm presenting reflects a different environment to what Akin yes, presented? Yes, than the one that presented uh, Akin Abayomi at the beginning, in which the situation in Africa regarding research and sharing samples and participating participation of communities, uh, well, not so good as what you have presented. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, so please feel free to correct me if I've missed your point. So what I'm presenting here is a, an African solution for using administrative electronic medical records within an African Department of Health for benefit of Africans. I can assure you that we are not short of what we refer to as predatory data requests from off the continent of people trying to get hold of the data that we have for their own purposes unrelated to the provision of healthcare to our individuals. So in terms of historical exploitation, maybe the difference with our um, health information exchange is that we put in a data governance structure before any piece of any data might become available for, you know, in a way that could be exploited. So I'm not sure if that's answering what you're raising, but we have here a microcosm of something that, that was built fairly recently and was built with a protective data governance infrastructure from day one in a very controllable and controlled environment. Uh, we're also not talking about consented data. So, I mean, there is no way we would make these data open. It's not even a question. I think the areas are much more blurred when you start looking at programs that are generating research data by researchers. You have researcher interests, funders' interests. It's not necessarily so straightforward to draw these governance structures in the way that you can with unconsented medical records. I mean, I don't believe there's anywhere in the world that would propose making their entire population's medical records, you know, fairly freely, openly available in an unconsented way. So I think they're very different scenarios. Uh, and we've, you know, had the date. I, I've worked in genomics for a long time, and maybe it was Providence that brought me in on the project right at the beginning, because I pushed very hard around the data governance structures to ensure that they're in place to prevent the kind of exploitation that is our history in Africa. Thank you, Nikki and um, Agda for the presentations. My name is Kenneth. I'm from University of Jos in Nigeria. My question is to Agda, just to learn from your experience. Well, I would want to know what um, exact kind of community engagements did you undertake in the Peruvian indigenous community? What did you engage traditional leaders? Did you engage religious leaders? Did you use, you mentioned in your presentation that there were traditional medical practitioners that these people listened to. Did you walk through them or did you use your Western physician knowledge to go straight to the people. Which one worked best? Because when we know what worked best, then we can actually learn from your experience and use them in other places that have the same kind of problems. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, in the methodology, we decide to make a focus group with uh, principal actors, actors of the community. We travel to Cusco, and we travel to Puno. They are two uh, high altitude places in Peru. So beautiful. <laughs> and we uh, make the focus group and, and the research with the uh, uh, traditional leaders, Quechuas and Aymaras, and traditional uh, physician uh, doctors. Uh, because uh, the objective was know about the perceptions and attitudes of the community with the same values, the same context. We uh, 
didn't go to the hospitals or the private clinics. We were, we were uh, in the community. So we have a question at the back, and then Florencia will have the last question for her, and we'll close the session. Hello, I'm Manjulika from uh, Bangalore, India. I'm a social scientist. That's my background. Uh, thank you both very fascinating uh, presentations. I think the scenario in India is quite similar to both Africa and uh, Peru. Um, my question to Nikki, this is more a clarification, that um, is it so that your entire um, program is run on taxpayers' money and um, no other uh, funding source, uh, that was one. And um, in a way, connected with Calvin's and the other questions, uh, would the primary analysis be done by in-house researchers or an analyzers? And um, what comes into the public domain? What form of data, if any, comes into, or is it only the final reports that are put into the public uh, domain? And if there are gaps between what you internally can analyze versus what the needs of improvement for better healthcare delivery uh, or the health system, then do you search out researchers to, to look into the analysis of the data? Because like we said in the earlier presentations, then it becomes a responsibility to that larger data set to reach possible outcomes and utilize that data to its maximum potential. I have another question, but that's very separate. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't have enough memory coffee. space for more than yeah. three. <laughs> Maybe we can discuss at the coffee. Yeah, so my first question, uh, you asked if this is done under taxpayers' money. Um, so in fact, um, my colleague who started the program, Andrew Bull, he's a medical specialist who has part of his time at um, the Department of Health, and part of his time he's an academic researcher at the School of Public Health. So we received some funding um, which allowed us to build the data center. It's a funding of an academic program that allowed for the secondment of data analysts to go full time to the data center. So no, it wasn't built on taxpayers' money, but it was built um, with uh, the help of the NIH. And we also have um, Gates funding to, to, we call it shrink wrap the model, so that if other, other African countries are interested in building something similar, that we have a, a, a setup ready to go that we can roll out. And we're already working with other groups who want to replicate our data center model. So no, it wasn't built with taxpayers' money. It, it was built on secondment from University of Cape Town, um, the analysts, but it's built within the infrastructure of the uh, Department of Health. So the second question was around um, what goes into the public domain. So if academic researchers request data sets that are consented, et cetera, et cetera, and tick all the boxes, those data sets that they analyze will then result in publications that are available through whatever medium they choose. The, um, the internal data analysis done, we have a very competent and vibrant um, set of health systems um, groups within the Department of Health, and we actually sit in essentially an epidemiological um, unit that looks at epidemiological analyses. And uh, then people from different sectors of the health services, maybe facility-based, maybe specific illness-based, will contact us to ask us for, for data sets to support what they need to know. And those individuals will work with us to ensure that they can analyze those data and get what they need out of it. So we'll help with the internal data analysis, but we have medical registrars, health, public health specialists, facility managers, uh, nurses, people who need those data can come from all spectra from the health service. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. Florencia, you have the last question. Okay. Um, well, I congratulate both speakers and also the previous presentation. They were, they were very good. 
Um, so my, my, there's a little comment and a question to Agueda. Um, I thought it was very creative, if I understood uh, well, this idea of trying to find uh, like native uh, way of understanding what a biobank was and playing with this idea of tambos. Uh, so I, I think that was very well done. And my question has to do with, um, uh, you said it was an academic uh, project. And uh, my question is, uh, was it related to some kind of research afterwards? And do you have some follow-up about uh, if there was some kind of research or using this kind of uh, approach to get some knowledge regarding, for, you said there, were, there are lots of infectious diseases and this is knowledge that is needed. So what kind of follow-up in that sense was there afterwards? Thank you, Florencia, for your question. Um, it really was a um, very strong uh, work because we don't have idea how we can start uh, for uh, educational intervention. Um, some of my students of uh, post grade told me, they say, why we don't have, a, why we don't do um, have something in a, in, a, in a traditional language? Uh, we travel to Cusco and Puno, and we have uh, interesting uh, work uh, with uh, leaders, and we talk. Um, my suggestion is when you start a project, you have to include the leaders when you are writing the project, the protocol, uh, when you are trying to develop the objectives, when you are uh, writing the methodology. It's a, it's a, a good step. Yeah. When we have the idea, uh, we write, we start to write, and we uh, talk with translators, Aymara and Quechua translators. Um, my suggestion is um, when you want to, tr to do something with indigenous or any uh, communities, you have to listen, you have to see, you have to visit, and, uh, you have to know about the context. And, and then um, the second step is uh, know about the, the disease. Uh, we review about the effect, uh, all the mortality and morbidity disease of the, this community is important. And then we are in a similar, in a similar uh, level for a start to talk. And then uh, my suggestion is um, uh, try, try to find uh, a support. Our support was translators and, and uh, women leaders. They help us a lot. Uh, we have two, two, two women uh, leaders and support us all the, all the, all the project uh, in uh, Cusco and Pono. Um, the other suggestion is uh, try to, try to uh, find um, a specific, uh, try to talk uh, with them with the specific problems of the community. We talk about um, the disease, uh, uh, infection disease, because for them was the most important in, 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 in this time. We talk about uh, dengue, uh, yellow fever, chikungunya, uh, Zika, and then uh, we talk about the uh, chronic disease too, because uh, was an issue for them. Uh, after that, we opened the doors for, uh, for our project because the community understand we want to help them. We want to talk in the same, uh, in the, with the same words, in the same level, with the same necessities. No, uh, now we have the, the first contact and they want we return with another uh, research. Uh, now they understand about biobanks. When I return to my city, I talk with uh, 
people from my university and said, oh, why we don't uh, start with biobank uh, research? Uh, my authority said, yes, uh, you can do it. And then I talked with, uh, with the leaders and they, they, they want, we continue with research. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. Um, I wanna thank um, uh, the audience for the questions and discussion. Um, I wanna thank uh, Nikki and Agda for those excellent presentations and the case studies, uh, very unique and different that have illuminated a lot of the issues that I think we're gonna take now into our breakout groups.